G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for today's video, which is going to be intended as a bit of a casual guide to the 2021 AFL draft. So the thinking behind this video is that most people, you know, either aren't that interested in the draft or not that educated about it every year and probably don't know exactly where to look to become educated on the draft. Or perhaps you're a little bit more like me and, you know, you've been so embroiled in the football season, you haven't had time to take interest in the draft, but you want to start catching up because we're at round 23 of the AFL season. Now, look, it's a reasonable question to ask, am I only starting to get interested in the 2021 draft because I'm an Eagles fan, we just lost the Derby, we're pretty much out of the finals and our season is effectively over. Is that a factor? You betcha. Looking towards the draft and the and the unlimited possibilities that brings, that is the next point where I can possibly derive any excitement out of the rest of this season. Now, I'm half joking. I do obviously really enjoy the draft. If you've followed the channel for a couple of years now, in particular last year, we did a bunch of pre-draft and post-draft content as well. So it is generally a passion of mine. I want to give you guys who perhaps haven't gotten themselves into the draft just yet for this season, a little bit of a taste of what it's going to look like. So the first thing to bear in mind is that the 2021 draft, like 2020, perhaps not to the same extent, is going to be somewhat compromised by the whole COVID-19 thing going on. Now, as we saw last year, there has been no draft more compromised than the 2020 draft where, uh, you know, only 59 picks were taken, which is, you know, a lot shallower compared to previous years. And a lot of that was as a result of, you know, less exposure to these under 18 kids who, you know, there was no championships, hardly any junior footy, particularly in Victoria. And as such, there was less data on the kids, less recruiter certainty, and less kids taken overall. Add to that, you know, the financial strain on football clubs at the moment, that's led to smaller list sizes so that more players can sort of share the salary that's left over, which means clubs theoretically have to cut a lot harder so they can take more picks. It's not really a recipe for long and deep drafts. The flip side to a shallow draft last year where there was a lot of uncertainty is that there were a lot of talented kids that probably missed out where in previous years they would have got that opportunity. So what happens to them? They go straight back into the talent pool, they apply their trade for another year and their chance to get drafted this year as well, which in theory makes this talent pool deeper. That being said, interestingly, despite, you know, Victoria having very little to no junior football last year, still six out of the top 10 picks, including the number one pick overall, Jamara Ugal Hagen, were from Victoria. Now, the hope at the time was that 2021 would be a lot better in terms of COVID-19, and I guess in some ways it has, but not really so much. There's been lockdowns left, right, and center, and as such, there has been a huge toll on junior footy, and in fact, there's been no national champs this year, which used to be a yearly thing. So like I said, this draft, in theory, should bat deeper than last year's, but it's still counteracted by the fact that there's still a lot of uncertainty around these kids due to lack of exposure. So my thinking is, on this basis, that like last year, there could be less value placed on really, really high draft picks this year because of that uncertainty. There's less, you know, certainty that, you know, the pick four overall in the draft this year is necessarily that much better than say pick 20. And we know in the AFL drafts historically, lots and lots of gems get picked up later in drafts than the other sports comparatively like the NBA. So as a result of that, you could see clubs maybe favor a situation where they hold pick 10, 25 and 35, and perhaps they prefer that to holding picks four and 12. So what we could see between now and the actual draft night is clubs with, you know, potentially high picks, potentially trading down the order in order to get an extra first or second rounder, sacrificing, you know, a really, really high spot in the draft. I hope this is making sense so far, but if you want a really good resource on what picks every club holds at the moment, there is a thread on Big Footy by a bloke called Law, where it has a live Excel spreadsheet updating every week, showing you what your club actually has at the draft at the moment. If you haven't seen that before, you can check out the link in the description of this video. As you'll be able to see from this sheet, you can see that Richmond actually are adjudged to have the strongest draft hand at the moment going into this year's draft. It's largely calculated on points, so I think the fact that they have more picks probably influences that a little bit, but they do hold three top 25 picks, and I think that's come at a very good time for Richmond, who may be seeing a little bit of a transition on the horizon. Some other noteworthy things from that spreadsheet, you'll see that GWS currently hold Collingwood's first pick in the draft, and I'm sure when Collingwood traded it in order to sort of help their father-son situation, they didn't foresee that they would be 17th on the ladder at one point. So I'm sure GWS will be watching the Adelaide North Melbourne game with a bit of interest, because if Adelaide win that game, they in theory go higher than Collingwood, and GWS could have 
pick two overall in the draft. Like pretty much every year, Gold Coast also hold a particularly strong draft hands with pick four, 19 and 23. But then I think they're another one to watch as well. They'll probably put those picks on the table. And I think I think it's kind of come to a point where they've drafted as much young talent as they potentially need. And if there's an opportunity for them to trade a high pick for a gun player, they should absolutely go for it. That being said, convincing a player to come to the Gold Coast is a completely different matter. You'll also see that the Dogs and the Pies don't have a particularly strong presence in this year's draft. As I said before, the Pies traded out of the first round this year knowing that they're going to get a father-son in Nick Dacos, so they just simply need to match the points and don't need to hold an overall first rounder. The Dogs also have just picks 15 and 70 as they currently stand, but they've got a father-son of their own, which I'll get into momentarily. If you want some really good analysis on the individual draft prospects, I do recommend recommend going again to Big Footy. There's a guy called Nightmare. I'll include the link in the description as well. He does a really, really in-depth analysis on all the draft prospects and does this fandom draft right before the draft as well. So in addition to checking out True Footy and if Callum Toomey's content on afl.com.au doesn't quite whet your appetite, go check out Nightmare. So for those unaware as well, this is the first year of the new academy rules. So as we saw last year, the number one pick overall, Jamara Ugelhagen, was an academy match bid by the Western Bulldogs who didn't hold pick one, but they were able to match the bid and effectively took him with pick one overall. The rules have changed likely as a result of that exact scenario. So what that actually means is if you have an academy player that gets bid on in the top 20, the club that he's actually linked to can't match it if he comes in the top 20. They can only match it if it comes after pick 21. However, that does not apply to the father-son rule, and that's why Nick Dacos and Sam Darcy are potentially going to be top three picks in this year's draft. For them, it doesn't matter where the bids come. If father-son, those same rules don't apply. They can be taken with pick one. Now, father-sons are a very interesting and common theme in the pointy end of this year's draft. Of course, the number one prospect considered by Callum Toomey and uh, Nightmare on Big Footy as well is Nick Dacos, younger brother of Josh and son of Peter. Dacos is having one of the best junior seasons we've ever seen. And I know we've probably heard that quite a bit over the last five to 10 years about number one draft picks, but he's averaging 36 disposals a game. And I think he had 41 possessions and two goals in a game recently. He's a really balanced inside out damaging midfielder. Collingwood are going to love him. They're certainly going to match the bid and it makes sense because like I said, he's considered widely to be the best prospect in this year's draft. Sam Darcy, son of Luke Darcy from the Western Bulldogs, is also likely to go top three in this year's draft as the best key position prospect going around. So as a result, two of the top three picks this year are likely going to be father-son selections. The Dogs in particular seem to really benefit from this rule. Of course, you know, Tom Libertore is a father-son. They had Mitch Wallace father son in that same draft now they're getting a pick three out of Sam Darcy kind of benefited as well Josh Dunkley was a father son to Sydney they plucked him and of course through Academy they got another number one pick through Jamara Ugelhagen last year as well and of course how can we forget Ace Cordy but Sam Darcy is a 204 centimeter key position player. He can play literally in the ruck, forward or back. He's been compared to Max King and it's a draft where there's not a lot of key position talent. So if a club in that sort of early top three range has a need for a key position player, it'd be a clear decision for them to bid on Sam Darcy. So those are the two father-son picks likely to round out the top three. The other major contender for a pick one this year is South Australia's Jason Horn. Horn's a currently 184 centimeter midfielder who's played a bit of senior footy this year. He's really well ready made. He's played against some grown men and done really, really well. You can see this footage of him against Darcy Fogarty in the Sandville recently where Darcy Fogarty tries to break the tackle. Horn jumps in again and manages to bring him down, which is a huge effort considering Darcy Fogarty is built like two of me. He's a really high intensity pressure midfielder. He wins the contested ball and he also uses the ball damagingly as well. At this stage, he seems to be the clear choice for the first live pick of the draft. If you exclude Dacos, Jason Horn is likely to go pick two overall to North Melbourne, unless North Melbourne don't bid and decide to take him at number one. The interesting thing to watch for me here is that Adelaide hold pick two, or at least the pick after North Melbourne as it currently stands. And there may be a temptation to rise up the draft order to try and nab the local gun in Jason Horn. I don't know what sort of trade they could offer to make it happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if that conversation is at least had. Now, this year does have some gun academy players. In particular, there's a guy called Mac Andrew. He's a 200 centimeter ruckman that's linked to Melbourne. But unfortunately for Melbourne, if a bid comes inside the top 20, like I explained earlier, they can't match him. So it's just their luck. 
this is the year they've changed the rule. And from what I can understand, a top 20 bid is almost certain. So Melbourne's probably going to miss out on him. Now, Finn Callahan is another player who's caught my eye to round out the top five. He's a hardworking midfielder, sort of smooth moving, left footed mid, sort of models his game on the likes of Josh Kelly. And I think Bonds and Pelly, he said as well. You sort of got teams like the Gold Coast Suns and GWS with picks around that range just after the top batch. The way I look at it, I think he could be excess to requirements that Gold Coast have invested a lot in their young midfield. And they've got guys like Raul Sharp Flanders they've picked up in recent seasons and I don't know if a gun mid is quite on their radar but I could see him at the next pick being in orange and charcoal this year. In terms of the Suns pick, I do wonder if a key position defender is most likely going to be on their radar, and it may mean that they sort of have to reach for a tall in this scenario. There's a young guy called Josh Gibkus, who at the moment, other than Darcy, looks like he could be the best key defender available. It could be one where Gold Coast either trade down to secure a genuine tall, or maybe they reach for a tall that may not be rated in the top five or six, but he's the best available key position player. With the kind of lopsided nature that hasn't been uncommon in recent seasons, there seems to be a lot more quality mids and sort of utilities and flankers than genuine tall talent this could be another year where teams actually reach again for a tall. As the ladder currently stands, you've got both WA teams holding top 10 picks for the first time in a long time, although this will likely get pushed down due to those father sons. From a West Coast perspective, I think we are desperately in need of some genuine midfield talent, and a guy who's caught my eye early is Subiaco's Neil Erasmus. He's kind of like a high production forward sort of midfielder, although the big danger for us is that on the current ladder, Fremantle currently have the pick ahead of us, so the danger of missing out on a top WA prospect is very real this year. To be honest, there's no need to have a fixation on, you know, your club picking a player from your state, but that's genuinely where my mind goes when looking at the draft, I generally look at who are the best WA kids, but honestly, I would just be happy with the best available midfielder. But either way, might have to start barracking for Fremantle this round as they take on St. Kilda, because if they win that, they actually go ahead of us on the ladder, but we would actually have the better draft pick. So perhaps that is something to look forward to. Anyway, guys, that is my very rough guide to the 2021 AFL draft. Of course, it's going to get much more in depth as the off season sort of progresses. Obviously, there's a lot of football to go yet. The entire final series, which I'm really, really excited about, but that is just a little bit of a taste of some of the content that you're going to see on the channel over the next couple of months. I love the draft. Can't wait to start churning out that content, but not going to wish away the time of the season. Even though my boys aren't going to be a factor this year, it will still be a really, really good final series. So I hope you enjoyed this little preview. Stay tuned for more draft content, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.